In this lecture, we'll discuss difference in differences and fixed effects estimators that are um, commonly used for panel data analysis, causal inference with panel data. Let's first discuss the motivation. So how should we conduct causal inference when repeated measurements over time are available? There are two types of variations that we could typically consider. The first type is the cross-sectional variation within each time period. So you have multiple units, so there are some variation across units uh, that we can exploit within each time period. Another variation is the temporal variation within each unit that we can uh, also exploit. So those are the two types of variations that we'll have when the repeated measurements are available. Now, the simplest designs that one might consider is before and after design and the cross-sectional designs. Okay, so first let's consider, uh, let's discuss the before and after design. So the before and after design is what we're going to do is, here there's two time periods, time t and time t plus one. You have two groups, the treatment group and the control group. Notice that the treatment group received the treatment at time t plus one, and time t uh, neither group receives the treatment, okay? And for the control group, they don't receive the treatment uh, neither time period. So they, they, don't, they, they won't receive the treatment either time t or time t plus one. So if before and after design, just simply take the treatment group and con completely ignore the control group, and then use the uh, pre-treatment period, in this case time t, as the counterfactual outcome, estimate for the counterfactual outcome for the time t plus one. Okay, so because this group is a treatment group, they, they receive the treatment in the second time period. And so we have to infer y of zero for that group. And we're gonna use simply the, bef uh, the outcome that we observed before um, the treatment to be the counterfactual estimate. Okay, so that's basically the before and after design. So you take the, same tree, uh, same unit, and then compare the before and after. Now, this is not exploiting the, all the information that's available because we ignore control group. Conversely, we can also consider cross-sectional designs where we completely ignore the pre-treatment period, time t, and then just focus on time t plus one, where the treatment group receives the treatment and control group doesn't receive the con uh, treatment. So we can just use the control group outcome as a kind of factual estimate for the treatment group. Okay? So this is a standard design, but obviously this doesn't utilize the pre-treatment time period so that you're throwing away the information. So the question is, can we exploit both variation, both types of variations? So the before and after design exploits the temporal variation, but ignores cross-sectional variation. Whereas the cross-section designs ignore the time uh, temporal variation. So the, the, the motivation for difference in differences design is that we want to exploit the both uh, type of variation. Before I present the difference in difference design, let's, let me introduce the you know, well-known example, the very famous example the, by Kurt Kruger, minimum wage and unemployment. The question there was how does the increase in minimum wage affect employment? Many economists believe that effect can be negative because increasing the minimum wage, although may help the poor, that means that the employers might reduce the uh, number of people who they are going to hire because now the each worker will cost more. So it could be the um, it, it could be that increasing the minimum wage can actually hurt the workers by reducing the employment. So this was a very important um, policy debate uh, back in the 90s, and I guess still is an uh, important um, debate, whether the increase in the minimum wage, currently federal min minimum wage to $15, may um, hurt the economy or may benefit, right? So that's a debate. Uh, it's hard to randomize a minimum wage increase across different states. Uh, that's very difficult to do. So these researchers used the observational studies. In 1992, the New Jersey increased the minimum wage from $4.25 to $5.05. Okay. Neighboring Pennsylvania uh, 
stayed at the uh, 4.25. So they decided not to increase. So now um, they can exploit this variation that in one state they increased the minimum wage, the other state they didn't. They observed employment in both states before and after increase. So this is the employment is the outcome of interest. And um, as someone who live, used to live there can tell you that the New Jersey and the Eastern Pennsylvania are quite similar. Uh, sometimes you might not even notice that you cross the state boundary. Uh, they look at the first food chains uh, in both states, which are also similar in terms of price and wages and products they sell. So it's it's really nice design where uh, you're trying to control as much as possible um, the the units that you're looking at across these two states. Uh, so, and 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 the finally, first food chains, the workers in those uh, restaurants are most likely to be affected by this type of increase because many of those workers are earning the minimum wage. So it was a really nice reset um, design study. So what is the differences, differences design? The difference in distance design relies on so-called parallel trend assumption. And it's best um, illustrated by the figure. Okay, so here's the figure. So there's uh, two time periods here, the before and after the treatment is given. So in this example, the treatment group is New Jersey, where the minimum wage was raised. Um, the um, control group is a Pennsylvania, where the minimum wage stayed the same. Okay. On the y-axis, you have a proportion of full-time employee at these uh, first food restaurants. Okay. So what we observed is that for the treatment group, when the New Jersey raised the minimum wage, actually the employment rate went up. Okay. But what we would like to know is what would happen to New Jersey if they didn't increase the minimum wage. And then we're going to use the control group, the time trend of the control group, as a way to estimate the counterfactual outcome for New Jersey. The idea is that if the New Jersey uh, didn't um, increase the minimum wage, they would have experienced the same time trend as the one experienced by the Pennsylvania, the control group. So in this figure, you see the red line, which indicates the control group, the observed time trend. So uh, before New Jersey increased minimum wage, the Pennsylvania had about 0.31% among these first food restaurants for a full-time employees uh, proportion. But then that went down slightly uh, after the New Jersey in increased minimum wage. So the assumption then is the, of the power trend is that the New Jersey would have experienced the same time trend if they didn't increase the minimum wage. So you shift that red line downwards, in uh, parallel line downwards, and dotted line, dotted black line is basically is the estimate, the counterfactual estimate that can be obtained by using the Pennsylvania time trend. Okay. So the counterfactual for New Jersey is the uh, uh, black triangle and the difference between the uh, black, uh, black dot and the black circle as uh, triangle is the average causal effect estimate for the New Jersey, for the treatment group. Okay. So th in this way, difference in differences uses a time trend, observed time trend for the control group and apply that to the treatment group to obtain the average causal effect estimate for the treated. So that's basically the, uh, the strategy that's employed, identification strategy that's employed uh, in difference in differences design. Okay, let's formalize difference in differences um, design uh, using mathematics. Okay. So uh, suppose we have two time periods, I'm, I'm gonna call time zero for pre-treatment period and time one for the post-treatment period. We have a group indicator. The treatment group is indicated by z equal one. The control group indicated by z equal zero. Note, note that this is um, this is time invariant. So for each unit i, you're either treatment group or in the control group. Now the treatment indicator, assignment indicator, equal to one only for the treatment group in time one. Okay, in time zero, 
both groups do not receive the treatment, so the indicator is going to be always zero. So this is done by looking at the product of T, uh, time indicator 0, 1, and Z, uh, which is the group indicator, the product of those two things. Okay, so that's only equal to 1 when the treatment group uh, is in the uh, time 1. There are four potential outcomes, two for the time 0 and two for the time 1, okay, for each unit. And the observed outcome is, uh, is as usual, the yit, uh, which is a function of the treatment assignment indicator and the potential outcome. Now we can define the average treatment effect for the treated. Remember the difference in difference design, it's going to estimate the ATT, average treatment effect for the treated. And in particular, we'll be looking at, uh, for the treated groups, so the zi equal 1 in the uh, um, time 1 period. Okay, because time one, time zero period, uh, nobody receives the treatment, so there's no information about y of one. So we're going to focus on time one period, uh, difference between y of one, y of zero for the um, for the treated. Okay, so what's important is that y of one is observed here, so the estimating the first part of the difference is is easy, and uh, what what we're going to do using the parallel trend assumption is estimating the y of 0 for the treated group. Now that we can write down the power trend assumption, what, what it says is that uh, on average, the difference between um, the time 0 and time 1 outcome okay, under the control condition is the same, that, that, that time trend is the same between the two groups. Okay? So that basically says we can use the control group time trend, which we observe, to adjust to, to infer the counterfactual outcome for the treated unit. Altogether, we can uh, come up with the difference in differences estimator, where we look at um, the difference, uh, we first compute the difference for the treated, and then you next con compute the difference for the control, and then take the difference. Okay? That's why it's called the difference in differences estimator. Uh, because under tr tr under parallel trend assumption, this is unbiased for uh, average treatment effect for the treated. This um, estimator is applicable also to repeated cross-section data as well. So you don't have to have same individuals uh, over time. You could have just a random sample of treatment group and the control group, but different uh, observations in each time period. Right, because there's no, in this estimator, uh, nowhere it says you have to use the same unit. Okay? You're only computing the difference between the average outcome between two time periods within the group. So you can actually use this difference in differences estimator, not, uh, not just for the out data set where you follow the same same units over time, but also the repeated cross-section data where each, uh, each time period, different uh, observations are being sampled. Now let's consider the relationship between difference in differences estimator that we just discussed and the linear model. To do this, let's consider a two-way fixed effect model. So this model is a linear model. It's called the two-way fixed effects model because uh, we have two fixed effects. One is the unit effect, fixed effect, that's alpha i, and the second one is a time fixed effect, beta. Notice that the t only takes a value of 0, 1. Uh, 1 indicated time 1, 0 indicated time 0. So the beta is basically the uh, time fixed effects. So this you have both uh, unit fixed effects and time fixed effects. And z, as you remember, is a treatment assignment indicator. Okay? So this is a two-way fixed effect model. And we can fit this model by just running these squares regression, fixed effects regression. Now you can immediately see Alpha i represents the potential outcome on the control condition at time zero for unit i, because uh, it's a unit specific uh, parameter. And then if you add beta, that basically gives you the potential outcome under the control condition at time one, because the beta is the time effect. And if we give uh, add, further add tau, then it gives you um, the uh, estimate of the average uh, of 
uh, potential outcome under the treatment condition at time one. Okay? So altogether, basically the tau represents the average treatment effect for the treated, which was the, um, the quantity of interest that uh, was, uh, you know, uh, the quantity of interest for the uh, difference in differences design. Now, what is the parallel trend assumption in this case? What this says is that uh, using this uh, parameter parameterization, it's basically the beta, the, the coefficient for the time indicator is not depending on the group. Okay, so the beta is not indexed by Z. So the fact that the time effect is constant across the groups gives basically the parallel trend assumption. So we can um, can say whatever whether uh, the group is in uh, the unit i is in the treatment group or control group, the difference of the mean difference of the potential outcome under the control condition between time zero and time one stays the same. Okay? So the time trend is identical is expressed by so if I had the interaction uh, between t and z, then the assumption would be violated. Okay. Or equivalently, you can also think of this as the difference in the error term um, doesn't depend on the group indicator. Now, um, notice that both ZIT, the, um, the trim assignment indicator, and the epsilon, the error term, can depend on these unobserved confounders, unit-specific time invariant confounders. So by assuming the parallel trend, you are uh, relaxing uh, you know, the usual assumption of the absence of unobserved confounders. It's okay to have uh, unobserved confounders that's affecting the uh, selection into the treatment as well as the outcome. Uh, if you do this least squares estimator, uh, you get exactly the same thing as the non-parametric difference in differences estimator. So even though it, it, it's formulated as a linear model, you get the numerically identical uh, estimator as the non-parametric estimator I showed you in the previous slide where you just take the difference of two differences. Now, a lot of people use this fact, the fact that the non-parametric DID estimator is identical to the linear two-way fixed effects model in this two by two case, and that is two groups, two time periods case. A lot of people use that fact to um, justify the use of two-way fixed effects in the uh, more general case where you have more than two time periods, perhaps the treatment, um, you know, units may go in and out of the treatments, uh, not just all the way control and then get treatment at the last time period. But it's important to note that this equivalence relationship does not hold in the general case um, beyond this particular two by two case. Okay? So we'll talk more about that, but it's something to remember. So we cannot just use the two, two a fixed effects model and to generally to say, oh, okay, I'm doing the difference in differences. Now let's also compare this with the lagged outcome model. So the difference in differences model uh, approach is, is different from the lagged outcome model. So the lagged outcome model is we're going to regress the time one outcome on time zero outcome and um, the trim indicator okay? instead of uh, including the fixed effects. Okay, so here it's important to note that there's no fixed effects. We are controlling for the previous outcome, pre-treatment outcome, uh, to estimate the average treatment effect. Okay. If we write this more non-parametrically, we are basically saying that conditional on the past outcome, the treatment assignment is independent of the potential outcome. So it's like a usual assumption, except that now we have past treatment as the um, confounder. We can also condition further on some other uh, pre-treatment covariates, xi, as well as not just the past outcome. 
Uh, it's important to note that this approach, the lagged outcome approach, is neither stronger nor weaker in terms of assumptions than the parallel trend uh, difference in differences approach we discussed. Okay, now we'll talk about the precise relationship between the two, but it's not that one is better than the other. Uh, those two assumptions not, don't nest each other. <clears throat> this uh, lagged outcome model approach uh, is going to be give you the same answer as the parallel trend assumption, the difference in differences approach, if the lagged outcome is the same between the children and control. Because in that case, the, the difference, the, the trend is flat. So there's no, the difference, difference, difference in differences won't affect that, um, won't adjust for that time trend. Okay, so in this case, if the lagged outcome is exactly the same between the two groups, there's no difference between DID and lagged outcome approach. But otherwise, there could be a difference, and you don't know which one uh, is better in any uh, general sense. Okay, it's possible that the DID is right and lagged outcome is wrong, or vice versa. Um, so the question really boils down to the question of like where does this imbalance in the lagged outcome come from? Because if there's no imbalance, the two approaches give you the same answer. So the two approaches differ only when there is a difference in the lagged outcome model, uh, lagged outcome. Okay? And the question is whether that's where that comes from. Uh, difference in differences says it comes from unobserved time invariant confounder. Right? So this difference comes from the something we don't observe, and unit-specific time invariant confounder. Whereas the lagged outcome model says that the difference, this difference directly affects the trim assignment. Okay, so the lagged outcome is, the, the imbalance is coming from the fact that the lagged outcome is directly as affecting the trim assignment. So depending on which one of these scenarios is appropriate, um, you will be using a different uh, methodology. Okay. So now let's think about the precise relationship between the two. If you run the least squares estimator in the lagged outcome linear regression model, like the one I showed you here, okay? this model right here, um, where you regress y1 on y0 and the trim assignment. Okay, let's look at the precise relationship between difference in differences and lagged outcome estimators. Now, least squares estimator for the lagged outcome model that I showed you um, in the previous slide, that is, we just regress the y, the outcome from the time one on the outcome from time zero and uh, trim assignment indicator. If you compute the least squares uh, estimator, you can write it as um, difference between the treated and control group for time one outcome minus low hat, that's the coefficient, estimated coefficient for the um, um, lagged outcome, uh, um, lagged outcome, and difference between um, the outcome between the treated control for the time zero. Okay, so we can write it that way. And we immediately notice that if if the um, the low hat is equal to zero, zero then the um, least squares estimator the, for the lagged outcome variable is the same as the ID estimator. So that's a special case. Now suppose that um, the station suppose we make the stationarity assumption that is low is between zero and one, okay. and then without loss of generality, we can also assume that suppose the treatment group for the baseline outcome is uh, higher than the base, uh, baseline outcome for the control group. Okay. Um, that's not really an assumption because we can always um, flip that order. And if the parallel trend assumption holds, you can show that uh, the lag, the, uh, lagged outcome least square estimator is on average greater than the difference in difference estimator, but if the power of trend holds, uh, difference, difference estimator is equal to tau, okay? It's the true value, the average streaming fact for the treated. 
Conversely, if the ignorability holds, right, conditional on the past outcome, the treatment assignment is independent of the potential outcomes. Right, that's the assumption for the lag dependent variable model. Then the lag dependent variable model is going to be equal to the true value tau in expectation, and it still be larger than um, uh, difference in differences estimator on average. Together, there is a bracketing relationship. That is, the true value tau rides between the DID estimator and the logged outcome uh, estimator and, and expectations. So one could say that if you compute the difference in difference estimator and the lag outcome model estimator, right? So you compute the two estimators uh, from the same data set, um, the, that might bound the true value so long as um, parallel trend assumption or ignorability assumption, either one of them is true. Okay? It's possible that the both assumptions are wrong. In particular, if you have time varying confounders, uh, that could, unobserved time varying confounders, that could violate both the parallel trend assumption and the ignorability assumption. So this relationship is not going to be useful in that case, but if um, part of trend assumption or ignorability assumption is actually true, then um, then the est estimate rides between between these two est uh, estimates. The true value rides the expectation of these two between the, the expectation of these two estimators. Uh, it turns out this result is very general, so it's, uh, this similar result holds uh, even non-parametrically. So this is not just true for the linear model, but it's also true for uh, non-parametrically. Okay. Um, finally, I want to think about the adjusting the baseline covariance. Um, so we can make a parallel trend assumption conditional on the baseline covariance. So you could imagine that um, parallel trend assumption may hold better within certain groups defined by the pre-treatment covariance x. Ideally, this parallel trend assumption, you can examine the validity of this by collecting um, many time periods before the treatment happens and you know checking to see whether the treatment group and control group actually have the parallel trend um, over time. Uh, if you only have two time periods, you have no way of knowing whether there is going to be uh, likely to have parallel trend or not, but if you observe many out outcome, you know, many time periods before treatment is given, then you can check and see if the time periods, um, the outcome looks to between two groups looks parallel. Uh, we can also do matching, so the parallel trend within the pair, within the strata. Uh, we can also do weighting. Um, by um, using the propensity score. So here the treatment group, modeling the treatment, being the treatment group given X, and given that uh, propensity score, we can do the uh, weighting. Uh, now f notice that the form of the weights is the same as the weights we use for ATT. So if the ZI equal one, you see that uh, numerator and denominator it's going to cancel in the second term. Okay? Whereas z equals zero, then you have, so you're, con you're basically con weighting the control group to look like uh, the treatment group because we are estimating the average treatment effect for the treated. Um, the tricky thing is unconditional parallel trend assumption neither implies nor is implied by conditional parallel trend assumption. So what variables to condition on is really important, right? So it's not that the more you condition on, the parallel trend assumption is more likely to hold. You have to think about um, carefully what covariates you're going to condition on. And that consideration is often difficult to justify unless you have, you know, sev at least several time periods before the treatment is given so that you can examine the plausibility of the parallel trend assumption by looking at the pre-treatment outcomes over several